Hey, we come to church to learn so many different things. What is God really like? What does he really want from us? Who are we? Are we sinful creatures or are we made in the image of God? Those are things we like to talk about. What really matters most in life? Those are the things that we try to talk about every week. How do we learn to let God's divine love flow through us? All very important lessons. And on ordinary days, that's enough. But then life happens and we find ourselves in a crisis. And suddenly that's not enough. Suddenly that's not enough. I brought this out because I wanted to show you something just to kind of give us a launching pad for the talk today. And I think it'll be very, very helpful. Um, this, is, this is how I want us to understand how the sermon is going to relate to each of us. I want you to think about life. And, and this line here is going to represent the intensity of a struggle, the intensity of what you feel in this life. This represents kind of how long um, you, you live your life. And I want you to notice something called capacity and demand. In other words, you and I start out on this life and the red will be capacity and we have the ability to handle stuff. That's the capacity that we have to handle things. Now, hopefully, as we grow older, we are getting a little bit better at handling and having a capacity to handle struggles and trials and difficulties that come, come about in our lives. You understand that? That's the capacity we have to handle things. And life rocks along pretty good as long as the demand for life stays under the capacity that we have to handle it. You understand? If I get a letter from the IRS, which I have had happen before, and if a letter says, Mr. Waters, we have recalculated your taxes and you owe us $372, and I have $500 in the bank, that means this little almost scare isn't such a big deal because my capacity is greater than that demand and it's like, yes sir, Mr. IRS agent, I will put that in the mail to you right away. But. What happens when the IRS writes you and says, Mr. Waters, we have recalculated your taxes over the last several years, and we have discovered you owe us $15,722, and we want it now, and I have $327 in the bank. Suddenly, that little issue takes it past my normal capacity to, un to handle it. You follow me? Same thing with the doctor. I go to the doctor, and he says, Mr. Waters, you're looking good. We've done some tests. Your health is not as great as we hoped it would be. We tense up just a little bit. Your blood pressure is a little high. We want you to get on some cholesterol medicine. We want you to get on some blood pressure medicine. Well, I can handle that, right? That's, that puts me back down here. That's something that's within my capacity to handle. It's like, yes, sir, that's great. I want to get on the medicine. But we also know, and we've experienced either personally or through someone we know, when the doctor says, sit down, I got to talk to you about something. Your health is of grave consequence right now, and we don't know exactly how you're going to be able to get through this. Relationships, it happens in relationships. You know what it's like when you're dating somebody and you're really tired of it, it's just not going where you want it to go, but you don't know how to get out of it. And they say to you, can we have a talk? And you say, sure. And they say, you know, I'm not really happy and I think I want to date other people. And you, you may tear up, but you're really happy. You're down here. This is like, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You know the feeling, right? <laughs> David giving me two amens on the front row. David has been there, you know. But what do you do when that person that you really have been committed to that you really had no earthly idea when they say, I want more and I think I'm out. Suddenly the demand is so much greater than the capacity. What do we do in that space? When we find out it's a lot tougher than we had thought. That's what I want us to think about today. I want you to think about not the ordinary, how does God's love flow through us? Not the ordinary, who is God? Who are we? All of that stuff's important. We're going to talk about that most Sundays. But what do you do when you get that word 
that suddenly the demands of life are way, way greater than your capacity to handle it. That's what the Psalm is about we're gonna look at today. We're winding up our summer series on the songs of summer. We've been looking at the Psalms and there's so many great Psalms and they talk about so many wonderful things. Uh, There are psalms of praise where we just have learned sometimes in life we just need to know how to praise God. Then there are psalms of lament. Sometimes in life we just need to realize it's just going to be a crying time and we need to be able to pour out our souls to God. We've learned from the psalms sometimes we just need to ask for forgiveness because that's what's blocking us. We understand that. But there are also psalms about what do you do when the demand exceeds our capacity, and that's what today's about. Now, the psalm is one of my favorites. It's Psalm 46. But before we get into the study of the psalm, I need to tell you the backstory because in many of the psalms, we know what was going on right before the psalm was written. This is one of those classic examples. This psalm was written, and you can read the story if you want to. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. So this afternoon, if you want to go home and just spend some time, you can read the story. It's a quick story. You'll you'll be really blessed by it, I'm sure. But this happened right after a tragedy was averted in the life of King Jehoshaphat. I know many of you don't even know who that is, but just stay with me. He was a good king. He was a king over the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. Jerusalem was the capital city. King Jehoshaphat had a situation that came upon him where suddenly it just spiked. It was like the worst situation in the world. He had to figure out what he was going to do. God navigated the situation, worked things out, and then his songwriters wrote a psalm, and that's what Psalm 46 is all about. Let me give you the story. King Jehoshaphat is described as a very good king in the Bible. There's not a lot of good kings. He is considered a good king. One day his patrolling troops went way far out away from the kingdom and they saw on the horizon the dust clouds of three mighty armies all marching toward Jerusalem. Imagine that, an army coming from this direction, an army coming from this direction, and an army coming from this direction. They investigated and they found out that the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Meonites had made a treaty together and they were all coming to plunder Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Jerusalem is a real weak country at this point in time. And they look out and these scouts discover, oh my gosh, these three mega powers are coming against us. It's going to be a matter of days. We've got to get back to King Jehoshaphat. King Jehoshaphat. When he hears the deal, he is understandably afraid because he has had his uh, military depleted. They don't have much of a chance. He is overwhelmed. There's no way he's going to be able to hope to win a battle against these three major forces, not with his tiny ill-equipped army. So he did what we do. He began to pray, oh God, oh God, what am I supposed to do? He poured out his heart to God. You can read it, 2 Chronicles 20. And in response, God sends a prophet to him by the name of Jehaziel. And Jehaziel has a message. He says, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says to you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged because of these vast armies that are heading for you. The battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. That's good news. That's good news. When he heard this, Jehoshaphat led the people in a worship service. All of Israel got together and they just worshiped God. Thank you, God. We don't even know what this means, but you're saying the battle is yours, not ours, so we're going to worship you. Now, look on the screen, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 21. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers. They make a decision that they're going to walk into battle. They're going to head straight toward these armies. They're going to walk straight ahead towards the enemy because God has said, the battle is not yours, the battle is mine. So consulting the people, the king appoints singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. Imagine that. Instead of putting the big military guys up front, they say, um, Sharon, Rachel, Casey, Pamela, y'all get up front. And we're just going to walk behind you. That had to really suck for just a minute. I mean, I'm thinking that had to be like, are you sure about this plan? But they said, this is the plan. So they said, okay. And then the Bible says, this is what they sang. They sang, give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. So they're marching through the night. They're singing these songs. The singers are out front. The army is in the back. And verse 22, and I love the way it says this, at the very moment, at the very moment they're singing, they begin to, as they sing and give praise, the Lord causes the armies of Ammon, Moab, and the Mount Seir 
to start fighting among themselves. Suddenly these three armies all heading to Jerusalem now are fighting against themselves. So the Israelites crest the hill, it's just a little after morning, they look down on the enemy camp and all they see are dead bodies. They thought they were going into battle, yet it looked as if a great battle had already taken place and it had. In the night, God had confused the enemy and they had fought against each other and they had gotten really uh, confused about what was going on and they all died. Well, this was a great victory and Israel, of course, told this story for centuries, centuries, centuries about how God works the miracle out of something that was so devastating and Jehoshaphat's music ministers wrote the 46th Psalm as something you and I can hang on to when we too find the demand exceeding our capacity to handle it. Psalm 46, I want you to read it on the screen. God is our refuge. Now remember the Psalm, this was a song that was sung in worship. God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its water ro waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Selah, we'll talk about that in a moment. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now I want to look at this Psalm and I want to give you three thoughts that come out of, right of the Psalm to me about what we need to do when the demand is greater than our capacity to handle life, when we get that devastating news, when our heart sinks because we think this is too big for me. Three thoughts. The first is this, when the demands of life seem too great, I need to remember God is my refuge. When the demands of life seem too great, I need to remember God is my refuge. That's how the Psalm begins, uh, chapter 40 or Psalm 46, verse one. God is our refuge and our strength and ever present help in trouble. Now let me just tell you this, that word trouble, uh, that, that word trouble, there's 21 words used for trouble in the Bible. This one means kind of between a rock and a hard place. When you're in that place that is just, you don't know what you're going to do, you are stuck. You don't know what you're going to do. And then when it says refuge, that's not a word most of us use every day. So let me give you the definition for refuge. Refuge means a condition of being safe or sheltered from pursuit or danger or trouble. It means a safe place where you are safe from uh, any kind of pursuit, danger, or trouble. We are safe, the psalmist wants us to know, when we put our trust and faith in God. Now, what we mean when we say God is a refuge, uh, there was something in the Old Testament called cities of refuge. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, I want to give you an explanation because this will help you understand uh, kind of what refuge means, and then I'm going to give you one other illustration for this. In the ancient world, life was a lot tougher than we know it now. In certain parts of the ancient Middle East where populations were spread out, societies weren't well organized and judicial systems were few and far between, people kept law and order in a very primitive way. In those days, they had something called pre-summary justice. They worked on the principle of an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. If somebody killed another person, there's no trial, it's end of story, you're gonna die. If somebody poked the eye out of another person, there's no trial, you're gonna get your eye poked out today. You knock somebody's tooth out of their head, no trial, we're knocking your tooth out. That's how it was done. For example, if someone in your family lost his or her life at the hands of another person, this is what would happen. Your family would call a meeting together, you discuss the situation, and then you would appoint someone who would be known as the blood avenger. This person, as a representative of your family, would then go and hunt down the person who killed your family member and kill them and bring back some kind of a, a 
a piece of something that would let the family know that they're dead. Then a celebration would ensue because justice had been done. This was how it was done in the ancient world. But a problem arose in this culture because there was no provision for an accidental death. If somebody died accidentally, then it's like, what are you going to do? Let's say a woman is in a hurry to go to the market, so she jumps on her camel and she takes off, but a five-year-old steps out in front of her. She tries to stop. She screams out a warning. She pulls on the reins with all of her might, but the child is trampled. Horrified, the woman jumps off of the animal and tends to the little one as best she can, but it's too late. He dies. Well, the five-year-old's family is going to call a meeting. They're going to appoint a blood avenger whose orders are clear, track down that housewife, catch her in the open when her back is turned, chase her down until she can't run another step, then kill her and bring us back proof. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, that's not fair. She didn't mean to kill the little boy, and you're right. So in the Old Testament, God addressed this situation by saying, we're going to establish cities of refuge. Six cities that are going to be easy enough to get to in Israel that if something like this happens, if someone can just run fast enough to get to the city of refuge, when they get to the city of refuge, they're safe. Until a trial takes place, they're safe. Nobody can get them. We have cities of refuge in our country now. Do you know that? Cities like San Francisco, they're, they're a city of refuge where they say, uh, we're not going to, um, if, if someone who's undocumented is here, uh, we're not going to just voluntarily give them over. They're going to have a safe place here. Churches are often seen as, as places of refuge where uh, people who are undocumented can go and if they have the protection of the church, then sometimes the government leaves them alone. Anyway, this was a situation as a way for you're running for your life, you don't know what you're going to do. If you can just get to the city of refuge, then you're going to be safe. Anybody heard any footsteps that are unfriendly on your heels lately? where you think, oh God, I wish I could get to that. I wish I could get to a city of refuge where I could be safe. I wish I could get to a city of refuge where I'd have just a little bit of time to figure out what I'm doing. God is wanting us to know he is a refuge providing God. When we are in desperate situations and we don't know how the enemy is attacking, but we just know they seem to be coming from every direction. The Bible says God is our refuge. Let me give you another way to understand refuge. I know nothing about farm life. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. I know nothing about farm life. My wife, on the other hand, she's a country girl. She understands this stuff. I have never milked a cow or planted a garden or collected eggs from a chicken. But recently I did watch a chicken documentary on the animal planet. And so that was very, uh, as soon as I watched it, I said, I'm looking for a place to put this in the sermon because this is good news here. You probably know this, I did not know this. When a mother hen becomes aware of a predator or threats to her offspring, she responds by lifting her wings and within seconds, all the baby chicks disappear underneath them. And then where once there was a doting hen and several cute little down covered baby chickens, now all the predator sees is one mean looking mama hen. That's all the predator sees. She becomes a refuge for her children. She is their protection. Now, eventually the chicks have to crawl out and they have to face the real world. But for a little while, there's nothing like the soft shelter of those wings, their mom's feathers caressing their heads, her warmth stilling their shakes, her heart steady beating, gradually calming their fears. That's a refuge. This Psalm reminds us that God delights in spreading his protective wings and enfolding his frightened children. God is a refuge. Remember that God is a refuge. God is a refuge. It also says he's a refuge and a strength. So when you have this spike and you say, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm gonna do. You run to the refuge and then you accept the strength that he wants to give you. I've done a lot of funerals in my life. Pastor Ron is here. You'll meet him soon. He's probably done more. One of the things I have found myself saying again and again and again when families are devastated by death is, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I just know my experience has been God will give you the strength. I don't even know where or how it works, but I just know that you're going to look back at one point in time, you're going to look back and say, I don't know how I got from here to there, and it's going to be God giving you strength every 
step of the way, he's going to give you strength. He's going to give you strength. Remember the song we sang as kids? You know it, sing it with me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. God is our refuge. God is our strength. And then it says he is ever present. That means he's always there. You have to wonder about that. He is ever present. And when you understand that, verse 2 says, therefore, we're not going to fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, we're not going to be afraid. Because we're learning that we are safe with him. We are safe with him. Our world's rocked, but we know he is there. Then the verse says this, Selah. Most of the time we just jump right by that. We don't even think what that means. Selah is used 74 times in the Bible. It's used 71 times in the Psalms and only three times anywhere else and that's in the book of Habakkuk. Here's what it means. It means pause. It means time for a musical break. If we were singing this, we would sing that first verse and then we would all stop and we'd all turn and Darwin would begin to play the guitar or Jimmy would begin to play the piano. And we would all begin to think about what we had just sung. We would just begin to think about what were the words? What is the psalmist wanting us to understand? What is he wanting us to get into our hearts about these difficult times that sometimes sneak up on us? And we would have a moment of just quiet reflection. So can we do that right now? I just want you to bow your heads for just a moment and let's practice Selah, that's that rest. The music keeps playing, the guitar keeps playing, but we are thinking about what we have just read. When trouble comes, what do I need to realize? God is a refuge, I can run to him God is strength. When I feel so weak, he can be strength. And he is ever present, always willing to help me in times of trouble. Oh God, help me. Oh God, help us. Okay, second thing I want you to see is this. When the demands of life seem too great, I need to remember God resides in me and he provides a river of grace to me. Now I want you to look at the verse. I want you to see something with me. Verse four says this, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. Let me ask you a question. Where does the most high dwell? According to the verse city of God. PhD right there, buddy. You, that was awesome. That was awesome. City of God. Now in the Old Testament, the city of God was often referred to as Jerusalem, but it also had this mythical, mystical other place, which was kind of like beyond this world, beyond this world, maybe heaven. A lot of times they understood it as heaven, not as advanced. The New Testament advanced it more, but it was kind of that, that heaven thought that was the city of God. Well, we know this reference isn't about Jerusalem because it mentions a river flowing through it. So it can't be that God is dwelling in the city of Jerusalem because there was no river flowing through Jerusalem. Most of the great cities of the world are all built on rivers, but not Jerusalem. Egypt had the Nile, London had the Thames, Beijing has the Yellow River, Paris has the Sin River, Washington DC has the Potomac, and New York has the Hudson, and New Orleans has the mighty Mississippi. But Jerusalem is unique among most ancient cities because normally they were built on the banks of a river. That wasn't true, not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem never had a river running through it. So what does it mean the Most High dwells in the city of God? They thought that God dwelt in first the tabernacle, which was a little traveling uh, temple kind of a thing. And then they thought God dwelt later in the temple. But then Jesus says, no, 
you are the temple. God resides in you. God resides in you. So what I want you to get is when this happens, you need to remind yourself that almighty God is in you. He is in you. Every bit of him is in you. You have strength that you never knew. You have ability that you never knew. He is residing in you. God is not looking down at you in a crisis. We sometimes think about three tears, God is up there. God is not up there. God, we ask you to come into our presence. Are you kidding me? He's right there. He's right here. We are existing in him. We don't have to get him to come down. He's here. You reside and he resides in you. You reside in him and he resides in you. Then it says this, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God because the Bible was written in a desert environment. You know what? Anytime you see rivers in the Bible, it's a picture of enormous grace. It is a beautiful picture that would have just caused people's eyes to light up and smiles on their face when they thought about there is a river of a river that flows through the city of God. What a beautiful thought that is. That's like God has just got grace that he's going to pour into you. God has grace he's going to give you. So let me tell you something. You maybe have never experienced this in your life. You've always had grace for what you've needed. Down here, you've always had the grace you, you've needed to handle these things. But suddenly it spikes up very, very high. You know what people tell me who have experienced a lot of, a lot of life here? They tell me that God provided for them grace they never thought possible. They never knew it existed, but God gave it to them here. That's a tremendous thought. You're going through and you're saying, oh gosh, this is so horrible. But you remember God resides in you and God gives you a river of grace to flow through you. And that river of grace will allow you to handle whatever you need to handle. Third thing. By the way, in this verse, uh, let me go back just a moment, um, where it says, uh, uh, verse six, nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts, the Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Just a little footnote, one of the most popular hymns in the history of the church was written by Martin Luther, and it was called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A bulwark never failing. Anybody remember singing that song? I remember singing that song. That was written based on this song. This was his favorite song. And so he would say, let's sing Psalm 46. This was a big deal to him. And then as we read there, it says, Selah, which means pause. So can we pause again and just think about those things? Just think about, I don't know, maybe you're in that place right now and you just need to be thinking about the fact that God is in you. You're not a failure. You're not a bum. You're not pathetic. The living God is in you. He loves you. He's loved you from the beginnings of time. He has loved you. And he's in you. He's in you. He doesn't make any junk. He's made you. He loves you. Pause, think about it. He loves you. He resides in you. And whatever that mountain is you gotta climb, he will give you grace to climb it. Whatever it is. You say, but my loved one is going to die. That's tough, that's tough. He will give you grace to walk through it. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be, it's going to be tough, but you can make it. But I've just been living down so long. I don't know if I can get up. You can get up. You can get up. God lives in you. He lives in you. Third thing is this, when the demands of life seem too great, I must remember God wants me to relax in him, relax in him. 
Remember the initial story, King Jehoshaphat, his crisis, the Moabites, Ammonites, Meonites, all coming. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. You think he was relaxed? He wasn't relaxed. He was so tense and tight. It's like, oh, what? This is horrible. This is the worst thing in the world. But then he found out God's in control. God's in control. It's not your battle. God's in control. Psalm 46, verse 8, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he's brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. All of these things are just reminders to the people. Do you remember we didn't have to fight that battle? God fought that battle. God fought that battle for us. And then this powerful verse, one of the great verses in all the Bible, be still, God says, be still and know that I am God. Now, let me talk to you just a moment about that. When he says be still, that's often used as a verse to encourage contemplation. And I love contemplation. I hope you're spending time each morning contemplating who God is, who you are, what he wants for you. Contemplation is a good thing. That's not what this verse is about though. What this means when he says be still is this, let it drop, relax, let it go. Be quiet and let it go. Let it go. You're like this. If you're like me, you're like this. You're just so tense. You're just, it's like, oh God, I don't know what I'm going to do. Let it go, Ray. It's not your fight. You can't fix it. These big things, you can't fix these big things. These big things, God, God has to come into these. Let it go. Let it go. Is that a better way to live? You tell me. You ever been to Six Flags and taken a ride on a roller coaster? Who gets more enjoyment out of the experience? Those who clutch with white knuckles the front of the thing? They're, they're so tight they can't stand it? Or the person who says, take me where we got to go. Take me where we got to go. Take me where we got to go. God is wanting us to relax in our faith in him. I believe God is saying to us when the crisis comes and we feel afraid, try to let go of the fear. Let it go. Be still means let it go. Let go of the tension. Let go of the tension. Let go of the idea that you're going to have to fix this. You can't fix this. Let go of your anxiety. Let go of your nervousness. Let go, let go. You're safe, Ray. You're in God's hands, remember? He's the refuge, remember? He's your strength, remember? He's the ever-present help in time of trouble, remember? Do you remember there's a river flowing, grace pouring through you? He resides in you. You don't have to clutch so tight. Let it go, let it go, let it go. not easily done. It's something we work our whole life on to learn how to do. Every once in a while now, I'll do it a little bit better than I used to do it. And when it's over with, it's like, yes, that was awesome. That was awesome. I did it right. Sometimes I revert back and I don't. And then I say, Ray, 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 your capacity should be getting bigger and better. That's true. But then you also should just be learning how to let it go. Let it go. I have a list that I like to run through my mind sometimes when I'm in situations that are up above my capacity to handle. This is some of the things that I like to say to myself. I'll say things like this. Ray, this is an experience. And I'm here on earth to have experiences. So this is an experience. Hang on, buddy. This is an experience. This is an experience. Or I'll say, this situation is for my benefit. I may not know what that is right now, but I just believe, I just believe this is for my benefit. I do know the verse that says, God works all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. So this is for my benefit. I don't know why I'm going through this. I don't know why I'm going through this, but I know it's got to be for my benefit. Or this, my fears may come true, but the outcome is not going to destroy me. My worst fear may come true. The doctor's report may be accurate. 
There may not be a miracle on the horizon that's going to pull me out of this situation, but it's not gonna destroy me. This may even be good for me. I'm just gonna wait and see. And I'm gonna trust God every step of the way. Or I'm struggling with this right now, but my frantic fear isn't the real me. It's not the real me. I'm gonna be able to handle this. It will pass, it will pass, it will pass. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, you know, it came to pass, it came to pass, it came to pass. That means that however it is right now, it's not gonna be like this forever. It will come to pass. And so I just remind myself of that, it came to pass, it came to pass, it came to pass. Or this one, whatever fear may say, I'm gonna remember nothing can destroy me. Nothing can destroy my soul. Nothing can destroy my spirit. I am, I am built for eternity. Nothing is gonna, nothing changes that, whatever may happen in this world. Or this, change is inevitable. Realize that, Ray, change is inevitable. Resisting change doesn't work. If this is just about resisting something that's a change, we have to change in life. So just be on the, uh, just be aware, change is inevitable. Or there's something here for me. I don't, I don't have awareness of it right now, but there's something here for me. I'll find it. I've just got to put my eyes on it and be looking deep in it. I don't know. Or I think this, God is on my side. God is on my side. He is not against me. He has never been against us. Ever one second has he been against us. He has been for us, always for us. Or I am loved, and because I am loved by him, I know I am safe. Because I am loved by him, I know I'm safe. Be still and know that I am God. That's another beautiful word, know. In the Bible, the the idea of know, the first time you see it is when the Bible says, Adam knew Eve and she had a son. Adam knew Eve. There was a deep, deep knowing. We know God. We let loose of what we are hanging on to so tightly. And we know him, we know him, we know him. It's not surface knowledge, it's deep experiential knowledge. Now let me say this, part of this, part of this getting greater capacity, part of that is age. Part of it really is age. It just comes, unless you really are are, are developmentally challenged, it should come. But most of this happens in you because you decide you really want to know God. You really want to know him. And you want to think differently about the situation you find yourself in. It is not the weak-minded who can say God is my refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. It's not the weak-minded that can say God resides in me and he's providing a a river of grace to me. It's not the weak-minded that can say I can relax in him because I know him. I know him. And then, of course, there's that familiar sila, which means think about it. Think about it. And do that just for a moment, please. Think about it. This week, one of my best friends growing up called me, and he said, uh, I got to tell you this, just so you'll know what's going on. I have a growth on my throat. Um, He's a minister of music at a great church in Oklahoma. So it's like, oh my gosh. He said, it's a pretty substantial growth on my throat. Might have to take out a significant part of my esophagus. Please pray for me. Just later. The Village Cafe was started a long time ago by a lady by the name of Pam Betzel. Pam Betzel was just a quirky, cool gal, a single mom. Uh, she and her two girls moved to Ohio after they left the village, but she started the cafe 15, 18 years ago. I'd been noticing on Facebook, I saw her picture with hats on. And you know how you just don't pay attention to that at first, but then last week I wrote her and I said, I'm a little slow sometimes in, in being observant Something makes me think that maybe your world is being rocked right now. And she said, I have a pancreatic cancer. I'm just about to go public on Facebook. I have pancreatic cancer, stage four. They don't give me much hope. I'm going to Arizona to a uh, kind of outside of the normal type of way to treat it just to see if there's some hope. She said, pray for me.
Good friend of mine comes to the church. When she comes, she comes here. Good friend. This week, she went to the doctor with perfect health, only to find out she has very significant cancer. They put chemo ports in her, and suddenly, in just a matter of a day, Last night, another best friend from junior high texted me. I was working on the message. And he said, Ray, my daughter's in Baltimore with a swelling on her spine. The doctors say it looks like it's MS. And we're here and she's there and she's only been there for a few months. Please pray. I don't know what's gonna happen in any of those situations. Each one of these friends has crossed a line where their capacity can't handle the demand. I don't really know what to say. Except this. God is our refuge and strength. An ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God says, be still and know that I'm God. Father, thank you so much for the 46th Psalm. May it become strength for us when the demands of life are too great. Thank you for being a refuge. Thank you for not leaving us alone. Thank you for hope. Thank you for this day. In the name of Jesus.